so wonderful to have you here. I am thrilled that you're joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat. And many people know you as their bougie best friend and you give a advice, suggestions, I would say wisdom to those that are in the dating world on, on how to handle some of the perils that is, um, that is sadly dating now in this time in our lives. It's hard. It's hard out there. And you make it easier by just breaking it all down, cutting through a lot of the BS and reminding people that they have worth and standards and that they don't need to settle for anything, including a hike. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not a hike. If somebody invites you to a, like as a first date, as a hike, you're not doing that. It's first of all, not safe. You're going to be all sweaty. It's just not necessary. And thank you for the kind words. I somehow I just became this dating coach, quote unquote. I'm not a coach. I don't have any credentials, but I do have a lot of life experience considering I moved to the US when I was 22 on my own. My whole family is still back in Croatia. So that's about 10 years now. And I feel like when you move to a foreign country on your own, you kind of grow up super fast and you learn a lot of things along the way. And yeah, I feel like I always had this natural understanding of why people do certain things and I'm just trying to help women that are going through maybe I'm 32 now and like in my 20s I was making a lot of mistakes and I wish I had somebody like me that would just tell you stuff like don't go on a hike as a first date like don't go on a coffee date don't do this don't do that and I never had a person like that telling me what's what's never I never had somebody to remind me of my worth because topics like this were not really talked about before so I'm very happy to have this platform now and just to save a few girls of a bunch of heartbreaks yeah and you're and you're crushing it in all the best ways Thank you. and your platform has really exploded and you're reaching many voices and because of that platform that you have you're you're using it for a lot of good and one of the things that I came across was that you discussed your own health journey that you uh, discovered an ovarian cyst, you had to have surgery, and you courageously shared that with your audience. Can you walk us through like what brought you to the doctors in the first place? Were you having symptoms? Was it a general appointment? So my endometriosis story was honestly crazy because I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't experience any pain. I was just living life, working out, eating healthy. I thought I'm doing all the right things. And then I went for, I had an IUD and it was about like five years and it was time to remove it or change it or something. So I went to my gyno, regular checkup, totally regular checkup. I come in like all smiley and she did an ultrasound and she was like, oh, you have a cyst. And I've known her for many, many years. So I saw that something was weird. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? Was a, what kind of cyst? And when she, she like turned the screen to me and that cyst, like you couldn't even see my uterus or anything like that. It was like nine centimeters. And I was like, what do you mean? How do I, where, where is it? Like, I don't feel anything. I'm just, I was just so confused because usually after I obviously had my surgery and all that, I did my research and I started speaking to a lot of people about this and like people have excruciating pain and they just, they feel that something's going on and I didn't feel anything. So that's why I was so surprised. And then I went to get a bunch of these tests and two months later I had my surgery scheduled. And after the surgery, they, I guess, sent the mass to pathology or whatever. And they said it was endometriosis. And then I spoke to my doctor about like, how was it not possible that I had no symptoms? And he's explained that it was because of the position where it was. So I guess it like had space to grow or something like that. So that's why I didn't feel any pain. And I was just very surprised how after I started sharing it on social media, how many people were writing to me, telling me that they had a similar experience, that they their mom, their sister, their cousin, like everybody has it all of a sudden. I'm like, how did I not know about this? I, I just didn't even, why is female health such a taboo? And then after, you know, I started like talking to women, I have a podcast. So I was interviewing a bunch of doctors and women that are in the space. So I was just surprised. Why is this still such an unknown topic? Right. No, it's, it's crazy because when you think about, so endofan has been around for a decade plus. And I still speak to people 
that tell me that their school nurse doesn't know what it is. Their gynecologist doesn't know what it is. Their mom doesn't know what it is. And I know for myself, I went for years having bad periods and I had an ovarian cyst burst and the doctor was like, oh, I was like 16. You're like, here's birth control pills. My mom's well, why is she getting these? And then he's like, eh, some people will get them. <laughs> You're just kind of yeah. like, <laughs> some people get on them. your way. Right. And I was 32 when I got diagnosed along with infertility. And I know one of the things that you mentioned um, was that it was already affecting the quality, right? Your, your ovary was impacted by this. Oh yeah. Yeah. So after, so it was like connected to my ovary somehow. I, I don't know exactly like the position where it was, but the doctor said that it started like eating my ovary, but they were able to save it. And when it burst, like when they were operating me, it burst. So like they had to clean everything up and I was in the hospital for about a week and it was the worst week of my life. And after the surgery, like you're all bloated and in so much pain, I was, and I guess all the hormones, because I was, I had an IVD for so long and like they took it out while I was in surgery. So it was just so many emotions and it was in January. And I was like, this is how my year is going to start. So it's going to be almost a year. This is my year. This is like a welcome 2023. <laughs> but luckily after a month, I was totally fine. And I was able to just go back to my regular life. Do you know what kind of cyst it was? Uh, if it was an endometrioma or? Yeah, he. I, I think it was just endometrioma. When I was, after the surgery, the doctor just told me he first, so I had my gynecologist who didn't know what it was at all. And then my doctor, he assumed it was endometriosis, but he said, I can't, you know, I can't really tell you until I actually have the results and all that but yeah he told me that he doesn't really and I asked him is there something I could have done is there something I could have done to prevent it like what can women do and he said we don't really know unfortunately like we don't know why it happens and there's not really a way to stop it and my biggest fear is as you mentioned like fertility and issues and stuff like that and he said we were able to save your ovary but you know, you're 32, maybe it would be a good time to talk about freezing your eggs and stuff like that. So that's something I'm thinking about. Yeah. And so when I was diagnosed, like I said before, I was 32 and it was, okay, we're going to get you out of pain because I was symptomatic with a lot of pain. And it was like, okay, you'll go have the surgery. And then I found out I was infertile, like right at the same time. And that was what caused my world to crash down because I was on my career stuff. So I wasn't thinking about having a, a baby. Some people find out because they have what they call like silent endo, they're asymptomatic, they try to get pregnant and then they can. And then finally they said, hey, let's do exploratory surgery. And then they go, wow, you know, you're loaded with endo, but for whatever reason, it's not showing up. And then they have the endo surgery. Um, so when I find that found that out, it was like, okay, have the surgery. And then I was like, as aggressive as possible, as like, what do I need to do? to reserve my, my eggs, like whatever is left, what can I do? So I immediately went into like recovery mode for six, about six weeks and then started on my IVF journey and did egg retrievals and all of the shots and like multiple, because I had such a low reserve and I don't, I don't regret that at all because I have my son, <laughs> I have my Beautiful. son and he was born in 2018. So I always say like, do whatever you can to save up that money and do it for yourself, like unsolicited advice, because even if you decide, Hey, I don't want kids or whatever it might be. And meaning the general mm -hmm. you, you're never going to regret having the options. I a hundred percent agree. And I think this conversation should just be more, you know, people should have this conversation more when it comes to fertility and freezing your eggs. And obviously after I started talking about it, people were talking back to me and like have shared their opinions, but I don't see that many people talking about this in online social media. You know, sometimes you come across a doctor talking about this, but real people with real experiences should share their stories more because also I have a lot of friends who are going through IVF and it's excruciating pain and it's it's like mentally mentally you're going through a lot physically you're going through a lot and I just think that it's still like a little taboo oh yeah and there's there's definitely a stigma I had when I was pregnant and I was very open I was like yeah we did IVF and it was like is it your baby then I'm like oh, oh god you know and then you open yeah. yourself up like you think you're sharing you think you're going to be received well you're you know, leading with good intention. And then you sometimes hit these like roadblocks where you're like, oh man, like that was, I yeah. just 
criticism. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I got a puppy recently. And even when I started sharing stuff about my puppy, the way I'm like, raising him, people have something to say. So I think that's just a very the way of the world, right? Yeah, yeah it's the way of the world. I would say since you were asymptomatic, what was your recovery like? Because as you said, this was like, a very difficult time for you post op that you had a lot. I mean, your busy career, everything stops when your body essentially is like, I need rest. I need, you know, to make sure that you're back on your feet at your hundred percent. What was, what was the recovery like? And, and what advice would you give to anyone who might suspect that they have endometri endometriosis? I'm not going to lie. My experience was really bad because it was such a shock. You know, if I had pain, if I kind of knew something was wrong, maybe I would prepare myself a little more. Or I would kind of expect it or I would, I don't know. I just, for me, it was just such a, how did this happen to me? And I was almost mad at my body in a way. I was like, I, I'm doing everything right. Like I'm not drinking anymore. Like I am working out, I'm eating right. I was, it was just such a shock. But then after the surgery, I, so I'm born and raised in Croatia that's where I got my surgery because I have family doctors and it's just so much easier to get everything done there. I was in the hospital for a week and then another two weeks I was home with my family because it was not really safe to fly immediately. And I live in Miami now. And I was just very like confused and I was just taking it very easy. I wasn't I work out a lot now and but I back then I was like I'm not even I'm just going to listen to my body and just be kind and gentle to it because maybe it was its way of telling me to slow down with my work or maybe I should take care of even though I do take care of myself a lot that's why I was so surprised because I do my little self-care routines I you know meditate and you know do all the self-care things but I was, I think it was more like a wake up call to just be more mindful of the things that I'm doing in my daily life. I don't know. I just, I think it just changed my life in a crazy way because I was just go, go, go like career. Let's make money. Like let's, let's, I was just focused on my career, I guess. I yeah. think this was my body's way of telling me, slow down. If you're not healthy, <laughs> nothing matters. And those few weeks when I was dealing with the recovery, it was just a lot of thinking and a lot of realization, like, well, why is this? Everything happens for a reason. So I was also, and I understood that this happened to me because it had to happen. And opening the conversation about it, I think it just helped a lot of women because they were writing to me, telling me how they feel, felt better when they heard me talking about it. They felt less alone. So I think that was kind of a part of it too.